The Theory of Need and Marx by Agnes Heller. This is Chapter 1, Preliminary Observations on Marx's Concept of Need. When Marx summarized what was original in his economic discoveries by comparison with classical political economy, he listed the following theoretical points. 1. The theory that the worker sells to the capitalist, not as labor but as labor power. 2. An elaboration of the general category of surplus value and the demonstration that profit, interest, and ground rent are merely phenomenal forms of surplus value. 3. The discovery of the significance of use value. Marx points out that the categories value and exchange value are not new but are taken over from classical political economy. An analysis of these three discoveries, which Marx attributes to himself, will show that in some way they are built upon the concept of need. First, let us examine use value. Marx defines the commodity as use value in the following way. A commodity is a thing that by its properties satisfies human needs of some sort or another. In this context, it is relevant whether the needs are in the stomach or in the imagination. Satisfaction of a need is the sine qua non of any commodity. There is no value, exchange value, without use value, satisfaction of needs. But use values, goods, may well exist without value, exchange value, as long as they satisfy needs, which is precisely the definition of use values. It needs to be made clear from the outset that Marx uses the concept of need in order to make definitions, but that he never actually defines the concept of need itself. On no occasion does he describe what is to be understood by the term need. Use value then is defined directly in terms of needs. This is also true, indirectly perhaps, but in just as many parts of his work, of the idea that the worker sells his labor power to the capitalist. He gives use value and, in return, receives exchange value. What is it that determines the value which he receives, i.e. the value of labor power? We know the answer, the value of the means of subsistence necessary for the reproduction of labor power. The quantity of value which corresponds to a given level of productivity is in turn fixed by the needs of the worker. The totality of his needs for mere survival, including the maintenance of children, represents the lowest limit. However, on more than one occasion, Marx speaks of the historicity, historicity of these needs, their dependence on tradition, the cultural lo level, etc. We shall come back to this point. The worker then sells his labor power, i.e. a use value to the capitalist. As we have seen, use value by definition satisfies needs, the need for the production of surplus value and for the valorization of capital. If labor power did not produce surplus value and the capitalist did not buy labor power, the capitalist relation would cease to operate. The law of capitalistic accumulation, metamorphosed by economists into a pretended law of nature, in reality merely states that the very nature of accumulation excludes every di diminution in the degree of exploitation of labor and every rise in the price of labor, which could seriously imperil the continual reproduction on an ever enlarging scale of the capitalistic relation. It cannot be otherwise in a mode of production in which the laborer exists to satisfy the needs of self-expansion of existing values instead of, on the contrary, material wealth existing to satisfy the needs of development on the part of the laborer. For the present, let us simply bear in mind that the statement that material wealth ought to serve the workers' needs of, de of development is based squarely on a non-economic choice of values. But let us turn back now to the category of surplus value. We have seen that the production of surplus value satisfies a need, the need to valorize capital. But Marx also defines the possibility of, of producing surplus value in terms of needs. Throughout Marx's writing, there runs the idea that the possibility of producing surplus value comes about when a given society is capable of producing more than enough to satisfy its own vital needs. To be sure, Marx does not say that production of surplus value comes about in every such situation. 
but only that it is not possible without this surplus. The question of when the production of surplus value takes place and when it does not is a specific problem, a function of the interaction of innumerable factors. From the standpoint of its historical origins, the production of surplus value establishes and reproduces private property and the division of labor which, at least in its origins, is the same thing. The development of the division of labor and thus of productivity creates not only material wealth, but a wealth and diversity of needs. It is because of the division of labor that needs too are divided. The position of need within the division of labor determines the structure of need, or at least its limits. This contradiction reaches its peak in capitalism and becomes, as we shall see, the greatest antinomy in the antim antinomy system of this society. We can see then that in the new economic discoveries which Marx regarded as his own, the concept of need plays one of the main roles, if not actually the main role. One only has to look at the categories which he consciously passed over to realize that need plays no part in them. Classical political economy did not attribute any importance to use value, which therefore uh, presented it with no problems. The worker sells his labor to the capitalist, but both the aspects of this act that relate to needs are missing. And when profit, interest, and ground rent enter the discussion, no reference to needs appears here either. Of course, this does not mean that the concept of need played no part in classical political economy. On the contrary, it could even be said to have been a decisive concept. But the perspective and the context are entirely different from Marx's. The analysis and assessment of need are developed from the point of view of capitalism, and they are therefore purely economic. Economic value is the only value, the highest of all values. It cannot be transcended from any other point of view. The needs of the worker appear as limits of wealth and are analyzed as such. At the same time, however, the need that appears in the form of effective demand is a motive force and a means of economic development. In the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, Marx is already passionately rejecting the purely economic concept of need as resulting from the standpoint of capitalism. With regard to political economy, he writes, everything that goes beyond the most abstract need the abstract need, be it in the realm of passive enjoyment or a manifestation of activity, seems to him, the economist, a luxury. And further on, society as it appears to the political economist is civil society, in which every individual is a totality of needs and only exists for the other person, as the other exists for him, insofar as each becomes a means for the other. The negative tone is quite unequivocal. It is based on the Kantian imperative by which man should not be a mere means for other men. According to Marx, the reduction of the concept of need to economic need is an expression of the capitalist alienation of needs. In a society in which the goal of production is not the satisfaction of needs, but the valorization of capital, in which the system of needs is constituted from the division of labor and need appears only on the market in the form of effective demand. Later, we shall examine the structure of need in the society of associated producers, which Marx presents to us. Here, we want to draw attention only to one aspect of it. The society of associated producers cannot be distinguished from capitalism by a constant increase in productivity. In such a society, the increase in production is correlated with the quantity and quality of the use value. The material wealth of society advances, it satisfies and at the same time produces needs. It bears no direct relationship to the production of value, exchange value, because this relates to the necessary labor time. Through the mediation of the law of value, however, the increase in productivity can also be related to needs. By this law, the socially necessary labor time is diminished with the consequent possibility for the worker of satisfying a higher level of needs. But according to Marx, this can never come about in capitalism, partly because the valorization of capital sets a limit to the reduction of labor time, and partly because, and we shall see that this is the decisive factor, no structure of need can be built ab ovo that will enable ordinary people to use their free time to satisfy higher needs. 
This possibility can be realized only in the society of associated producers. That is, a society where needs do not appear on the market, where the primary emphasis goes on the evaluation of needs and of the corresponding allocation of labor power and labor time. A society where the whole structure of need changes, with labor itself becoming a vital need, where people share goods according to their needs, and where the primary needs are not those relating to material goods, but those directed towards higher activities, and above all those directed towards other people, who are seen not as means, but as ends. Now it should no longer appear to be an accident that the concept of need plays the hidden but principal role in Marx's economic categories, just as it is no accident that the concept of need is not defined in his critiques of political economy and capitalism. Marx's categories of need, we shall see that he gives several interpretations of it, are not as a whole economic categories. He tends to treat concepts of need as non-economic categories, as historical philosophical, that is, as anthropological value categories, and therefore is not subject to definition within the economic system. In order to be able to analyze the economic categories of capitalism as categories of alienated needs, e.g. the need to valorize capital, the system of need imposed by the division of labor, the continuous appearance of needs on the market, the limitation of the workers' needs to the necessary means of existence, the manipulation of needs. It is necessary to create the positive category of a system of non-alienated needs, the full evolution and realization of which we place at a future point when the economy itself will also be subordinated to this human system of needs. Before making a clear examination of Marx's whole philosophical conception of need, let us briefly see what various interpretations he applies to this concept. There is no physical or economic work of importance by Marx in which he does not repeatedly try, often in several different passages, to classify types of need. The classification is made sometimes from a historical, philosophical, or anthropological point of view sometimes on the basis of ways in which needs are objectified, sometimes from the economic standpoint, particularly in the analysis of supply and demand, and sometimes by the consciously valorizing application of the value category human wealth. We should add that almost all these classifications contain the aspect of value judgment, even when a value category is not directly used as a basis for classification. The very classification of these various points of view indicates a certain heterogeneity. There would be no inherent difficulty in describing Marx's position if the different standpoints were always made explicitly distinct. However, the points of view themselves are often ambiguous and unclear. This is particularly so because quite often the valorizing attitude is not conscious. Moreover, in his classification of economic needs, philosophical concepts often prevail. And last but not least, the status quo of capitalist society often influences the historical, philosophical, anthropological classification. This, and not any lingering Fauerbachism, is the reason why Marx does not go beyond the naturalistic concept of need, though he often tries to do so. The most problematical point is the classification of needs on the basis of their objectifications, that is to say, on the basis of their objects in general and of their respective activities, feelings, and passions. We shall see, in the course of analyzing the philosophical concept of need, that Marx considered the object of need and the need itself to be always interrelated. Types of need are formed in accordance with the objects towards which they are directed and the activities involving those objects. Marx's most general classification in this sense is between material and spiritual goods, although he also mentions political needs, the needs of social life, and the needs of labor, activity. In this classification, the value judgment is not a general sustained standpoint. The satisfaction of material needs is not only the basic condition of human existence. The expansion of material needs is at the same time a sign of the enrichment of man. However, there's still a certain spiritual need which can be alienated, the value judgment affects the totality of the structure of need. We shall return to this point later. 
Of course, there are individual passages from Marx where a different emphasis in one or another direction can be found, but this is always only functional to the examination of the problem, and one cannot draw conclusions from such passages relating to the totality of his conception. The historical, philosophical, anthropological classification is based on two categories, that of natural needs and that of socially produced needs. The first are synonymous with physical or necessary needs. The second correspond to social needs, at least in the applied sense of the word. How does Marx interpret these needs? In the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, he writes, Man produces even when he is free from physical need and only truly produces in freedom therefrom. Physical needs correspond here to biological needs, which are directed towards maintenance of the mere conditions of life. Marx, despite the appearance of the terminology, separates himself here from the naturalistic interpretation, as he does in many of his mature writings. This is not only the case when he is speaking about a radically new human social content in animal bio biological needs, a content which apart from one or two formulations is quite clear in Marx later on. It is also the case when he is considering the reduction of human needs to needs which, though they have a social content, are of a biopsychological nature, a product of capitalist society. It is bourgeois society that subordinates the human senses to crude practical needs and makes them abstract by reducing them to mere needs of survival. For this reason, needs aimed merely at survival cannot form a general, historical philosophical group of needs which is independent. Later, as a consequence of the economic point of view, a classification becomes necessary which, more or less modified, that is, with a different interpretation, appears in the writings of his maturity, the distinction between natural and socially produced needs. As I have already said, the economic point of view is an explanation of the origin of surplus labor and surplus value and of the possibility of their existence. But it is also motivated by the status quo when capitalist society is the point of departure for Marxist analysis and by the discovery of exploitation as the leading motive in the critique of capitalism. We ought now to concern ourselves with the contexts in which these categories appear. We shall underline the most important aspects. In the Grenries, Marx speaks of the capacity to consume as the creator of needs in capitalist society and distinguishes the needs created by society from natural needs. In the same work regarding capitalism, he says, Capitals, capital's ceaseless striving towards the general form of wealth drives labor beyond the limits of its natural paltriness, and thus creates the material elements for the development of the rich individuality, which is as all-sided in its production as in its consumption, and whose labor also therefore appears no longer as labor, but as the full development of activity itself in which natural necessity in its direct form has disappeared, because a historically created need has taken the place of the natural one. And further on, Luxury is the opposite of the naturally necessary. Necessary needs are those of the individual himself reduced to a natural subject. The development of industry suspends this natural necessity as well as this former luxury. In bourgeois society, it is true it does so only in antithetical form, in that it itself only posits another specific social standard as necessary, opposite luxury. In Capital, the category natural needs appears in relation to the, the determination of the value of labor power. His natural needs, such as food, clothing, fuel, and housing, vary according to the clim climatic and other physical conditions of his country. On the other hand, the number and extent of his so-called necessary needs, as also the modes of satisfying them, are themselves the product of a historical development and depend therefore to a greater extent on the degree of civilization of a country, more particularly on the conditions under which, and consequently on the habits and degree of comfort in which, the class of free laborers has been formed. In contradistinction, therefore, to the case of other commodities, there enters into the determination of the value of labor power a historical and moral element Finally, the value of labor power is defined as follows. 
The value of labor power is determined by the value of the necessaries of life habitually required by the average laborer. The classification given appears here for the first time. On the difference between the value of labor power in different countries, Marx also writes, In the comparison of the wages in different nations, we must therefore take into account all the factors that determine changes in the amount of the value of labor power. The price and the extent of the prime necessaries of life as naturally and historically developed. For the analysis of this question, I would refer again to Marx's statement that material production has always been the realm of necessity and will remain so even in the society of associated producers. With the development of the productive forces, this realm of physical ne necessity expands as a result of his needs. From all these quotations, it would appear that the category of natural needs, at least from the Grand Reese through to the third volume of Capital, has not changed its meaning, but that there has been a change in the concept of necessary needs. Let us first analyze the group of natural needs. Natural needs refer to the simple maintenance of human life, self-preservation, and are naturally necessary simply because, without satisfying them, man is not able to preserve himself as a mere natural being. These needs are not identical with those of animals, because for his own self-preservation man must also have certain conditions, warmth, clothing, for which the animal has no need. The necessary needs for sustaining man as a natural being are therefore also social. There is a well-known passage in the Grand Reese according to which the hunger that is satisfied with knife, knife and fork is different from the hunger which is satisfied by raw meat. The mode of satisfaction makes the need itself social. Nevertheless, there is a contradiction between the concept of natural needs as an independent group of needs and the concept of social or socially produced needs, or at the very least, there is something which cannot be coherently integrated into Marx's philosophical theory of need. Let us now examine needs as structure of need Later on, we shall see what Marx himself does this. Oh, we shall see that Marx himself does this. If we state that the structure of need as a whole can only be interpreted in its correlation with the totality of social relations, and a quotation from Marx's The Poverty of Philosophy will prove this point, then it follows that only socially produced needs exist, and natural needs, whose mode of satisfaction changes the need itself, also have this socially produced character. According to Marx, as we have seen, industrial production makes it possible to resolve the, the opposition between natural needs and socially produced needs. Even if in capitalist society this takes place in a contradictory way, and even if this society temporarily reproduces the contradiction, the overcoming of the contradiction between natural and socially produced needs is thus a result of the pushing back of the natural health natural limits. The pushing back of the objective and subjective natural limits is interrelated. Marx does not distinguish between internal and external nature. If, however, on the basis of this perceptive thought, it is unnecessary to establish an independent group of natural needs, then it is also true that external nature exists for man only in reciprocal interaction with society. In the process of socialization, in the organic exchange between man and nature. While the group of natural needs is not open to interpretation within the philosophy of Marx as a whole, the idea that Marx wished to express with the creation of this group is however plausible and simple. It is only industrial production and the capitalist development of productivity that, def that definitively, in Marx's terms, irrevocably, caused the maintenance of sheer physical existence to cease to be a special problem and goal, shaping the practice of man's daily life. People no longer work solely to fill their own stomachs and those of their children, and to protect themselves and their families from death by exposure. The development of industrial production not only provides an opportunity to satisfy natural needs fully, fully but where possible, does away with the problem, the contradiction, once and for all. The economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 contain the profound insight that, strictly speaking, it is capitalist society which executes the reduction to physical needs, which in other words constitutes the independent group of natural needs. In the later works, this appears as the capitalist reproduction of the contradiction. 
there can be no doubt that this shift of emphasis gives expression to a more positive value relation, value judgment, to the capitalist mode of production. Of course, the tabulation of this separate group of natural needs does not mean, in our view, that this concept is organically rooted in Marx's general philosophical theory of need, nor that we would maintain such a grouping in a Marxist theory of need today. In our view, the natural needs are not a group of needs, but a limit concept, a limit different for different societies, beyond which human life is no longer reproducible as such, beyond which the limit of bare existence is past. Mass deaths from famine in India and Pakistan show exactly this. It would be sheer elitism, at least in our world, to eliminate this limit concept from the discussion of man's needs. Therefore, I shall speak not of natural needs, but of the existential limit to the satisfaction of needs. We noted that the meaning of necessary needs undergoes a change between the grand race and capital. In the grand race, they correspond fully to natural needs, but in capital, the difference is stressed. Necessary needs develop historically. They are not dictated by mere survival. The cultural element in such needs, the moral element and custom are decisive and their satisfaction is an organic part of the normal life of people belonging to a particular class in a given society. The quantum which we refer to as the necessary articles or means for survival at a given time or for a given class serves to satisfy vital needs and necessary needs. In this interpretation, the concept of necessary needs is especially important, even though it is simply a descriptive concept. If we investigate empirically what needs ought to be satisfied so that the members of a given society or class should have the feeling and the conviction that their life at a given level of the division of labor is normal, then we arrive at the concept of necessary needs. The extent and the content of necessary needs can therefore be different in different periods and for different classes. For a worker in the United States today, necessary needs mean something different from the needs of an English worker in the time of Marx or those of an Indian worker today. Marx also has something to say about needs in this sense in the poverty of philosophy when he points to a contradiction between a worker's needs and his possibilities. This means that the necessary needs of the worker cannot be satisfied because they are not covered by effective demand. We have already said that we consider the category of necessary needs as a descriptive concept of exceptional importance, which is relevant sociologically, so to speak. However, its philosophical content evaporates precisely because of the descriptive character of the concept. When Marx speaks of the necessary needs of English workers in his day, he means by this not only material needs, but also those of a non-material kind that may be explained in the concept of the average. Education also appears amongst these categories, as well as books and membership of a trade union. But since the satisfaction of these needs at a given time and under given circumstances depends upon material means and is purchasable with money, in the case of membership of a trade union, Marx is referring to the trade union subscription. They must be considered as necessary and the amount of value spent in satisfying them includes the value of the labor power. However, individual needs do not belong to this category. Such needs cannot be average and in particular, the satisfaction is not purchasable. So some needs which are alike fall into different categories. Meat comes into the category of necessary needs artichokes into that of luxury needs. On the other hand, some needs that are different in kind fall into the same category. Whiskey and trade union subscriptions are necessary needs. When, however, Marx defines the characteristics of necessary needs not empirically, but philosophically from the standpoint of content, he reaches quite different results. The realm of, of material production is and remains so in the society of associated producers, the realm of necessity. In this sense, necessary needs are the needs that are constantly growing out of material production. In the society of associated producers, material needs in consumption and production have to be measured, and the labor power as well as the labor time which corresponds to it have to be distributed. In this context, and on the basis of this interpretation, 
spiritual and moral needs, those that relate to the collectivity are the opposite of necessary needs. Such needs will not be fixed, at least in the future, by their position in the division of labor, because they are individual needs that cannot be expressed by any average, and because their satisfaction is not purchasable, all the more so since there will be no money. These would thus be the so-called free needs, a characteristic peculiar to the realm of freedom. Let us turn briefly again to the problem of the naturalistic determination of natural needs. Since need for Marx, as we have already seen, is a kind of subject-object subject correlation, it is obvious that the problem also occurs from the point of view of the object, the object of the need, that is, from the point of view of use value. The naturalistic interpretation of needs presupposes a naturalistic interpretation of use value, just as the superseding of the former presupposes the superseding of the latter. With regard to this problem, all we can do is to indicate a tendency. It so happens that Marx gives different interpretations in one and the same work. In capital, use value is defined as the natural form of the commodity, which expresses the relation between the individual and nature. This same definition is to be found in the economic manuscripts of 1857 to 58. In theories of surplus value, a similar naturalistic conception is to be found. Indeed, it goes further. Use value expresses the natural relation between things and men, the existence of things for men. Exchange value is the social existence of the thing. However, in the same volume, there is the following statement. The autonomous material form of wealth disappears and does not appear again, except as a manifestation of man. Everything that is not the result of a human activity of labor is nature, and as such is not social wealth. The phantom of the world of commodities disappears and does not reappear except as a constantly disappearing and constantly regenerated objectification of human labor. If we now investigate the manner in which Marx grouped needs together from the economic point of view, according to supply and demand, we shall, albeit not definitively, move away from the, con uh, the conceptions discussed above. In Marx, the groups of needs which are respectively necessary and luxury needs are true and luxury needs, or true and imaginary needs, do not always and unconditionally have an economic meaning. The coupled phrase, natural needs, luxury needs, appears only in the Grand Race, where Marx, as we have seen, does not yet distinguish the former from necessary needs. The division, which can be interpreted unambiguously only by means of the economic categories, also contains, generally speaking, historical philosophical elements, and very often carries a valorizing emphasis. The question is whether it is possible to categorize needs, or the objects towards which they are directed, on the basis of their content and their quality, along with the categories of necessity and luxury, or whether it is solely and primarily effective demand that decides whether a need and the object related to it are a luxury. In the poverty of philosophy, the two solutions are not sufficiently distinguished. It must be, admire, uh, must be admitted that Marx inclines toward towards the purely economic interpretation. In his polemic with Proudhon's conception that the most used objects are at the same time the most useful, and according to which spirits ought, for example, to be classed as one of the most useful consumer goods, Marx makes the point that production decides on the concrete content of necessary needs. The more labor power is employed in the manufacture of an article, the more it approximates to the group of luxury products. In the same work, there also appears a non-economic definition that contradicts this interpretation. Marx writes as follows. The most indispensable objects, like corn, meat, etc., rise in price, while cotton, sugar, coffee, etc., fall to a surprising degree. And even among comestibles proper, the luxury articles, like artichokes, asparagus, etc., are today relatively cheaper than foodstuffs of prime necessity. In our age, the superfluous is easier to produce than the necessary. However, in this interpretation, luxury products or luxury needs are no longer an economic category. They appear instead as the counterpart of the descriptive sociological concept of necessary needs. 
and moral elements and historical elements, custom, etc., play an incisive role. In this case, luxury needs are all those things that by custom do not belong to the system of need of the labor force. The economic interpretation, by contrast, considers something a luxury article if its object, possession, consumption of the object, lies beyond the power of acquisition of the working class. In this latter sense, it cannot be said that luxury products become cheap, but only that the product which becomes cheaper than others used for similar purposes is no longer a luxury product. It can be shown with examples that this has come about in a de facto way. Today, sugar and artichokes are certainly not luxury goods. Similar problems are posed in relation to this, this same classification in the second volume of Capital, where consumer goods are subdivided in the following way. 1. Consumer necessities, regardless of whether such a product as tobacco is really a consumer necessity from the physiological point of view, it suffices that it is habitually such. And 2. Articles of luxury, which enter into the consumption of only the capitalist class and can therefore be exchanged only for spent surplus value, which never falls to the share of the laborer. I believe that this is the only relevant interpretation for determining what are luxury products and luxury needs. It is concretely applied in concrete situations. No specific product or need possesses the quality of being a luxury product or a luxury need that is determined solely by the question of whether the object is possessed and used, and therefore the corresponding need is satisfied by the majority of the population, or only by that minority which represents a significantly higher level of purchasing power as a result of the social division of labor. As a consequence of increasing productivity and as a consequence of changes in the social structure, needs that originally were luxury needs become necessary needs, without their undergoing the slightest qualitative modification. The opposite may also happen. Marx had already drawn attention to the fact that at the beginning of the process of capitalist reproduction in England, a part of what had earlier been necessary needs became luxury needs. So this is the Marxist concept that I accept and I think the category of luxury needs can only be interpreted in an economic sense. We shall refer to this problem later on, on the phase of prosperity in capitalism. Marx writes as follows. The working class also enjoys momentarily articles of luxury ordinarily beyond its reach. But the moment there is effective demand from the working class, this demand does not satisfy luxury needs in accordance with what has been said above such needs cease to be luxury needs. This ambiguity in the con concepts of luxury products and luxury needs is not at variance with, the, with Marx's general conception, by which the whole population can enjoy such luxury needs only in exceptional and brief periods. Prosperity is followed by crisis. The same articles and satisfaction of the needs related to them are once more unattainable, but the hindsight of experience of capitalist development it might rather be said, as Marx in any case always maintained, that every society founded upon the division of labor reproduces these economically separate groups of needs, necessary needs and luxury needs. Only the society of associated producers can overcome this opposition, not only because the so-called luxury needs cease to exist, but also because the system of necessary needs itself changes, opening the way for the development of individual free needs. What we are arguing against is simply the idea that luxury needs are definable in terms of their content and their quality, and that needs in general can be subdivided into necessary needs and luxury needs on the basis of their concrete quality or quantity. Fixed concrete valorizing categories appear also in the above mentioned groups. Marx may have referred just once to real and imaginary use values, but the main tendency is to eliminate valorizing categories. Nevertheless, the basis and yardstick of any regrouping or classification is need as a category of value. For Marx here, as on other occasions, the most important category of value is that of wealth. At the same time, this constitutes a critique of the use that classical political economy made of the category wealth, and identifying it with material wealth. For Marx, the precondition of human wealth is only the basis 
for the free development of all the capacities and senses of the human being, the free and many-sided activity of every individual. Need as a category of value is none other than the need for this kind of wealth. In the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, Marx writes, it will be seen how in place of the wealth and poverty of political economy comes the rich human being and the rich human need. The rich human being is simultaneously the human being in need of a totality of human manifestations of life. And later on, private property does not know how to change the crude need into human need. Marx rejects the society of private and capitalistic property, making his point of departure the value of rich human need. Private property is incapable of transforming crude needs into rich human needs, however great the material riches that it produces. The elaboration of the category of value, need, is the work of the young Marx. In his maturity, this category is already a given point of departure. He does not consider it necessary to analyze it anew. Nevertheless, it frequently appears later on in a direct and open form. Let us recall the quotation in which Marx contrasts the need to valorize capital with the workers' needs of development, or at its most clear-cut, the concept of radical needs, which also functions as a category of value. We shall deal later on with this concept and the key role which it plays in Marx's theory. However, these pure concepts of value are often found not only as the basis, but as the concluding point in the, in the critique of capitalism. There are not too many necessities of life produced in production or in proportion to the existing population. Quite the reverse. Too little is produced to decently and humanely satisfy the wants of the great mass. But one does not need to fall back on examples of pure categories of value in order to demonstrate that every judgment concerning needs is measured on the basis of the positive value of rich human needs. What else could have served as Marx's basis for, for rejecting the bifurcation between luxury needs and necessary needs? How else could he have denounced a society which creates wealth on the one hand and poverty on the other. By what other criterion could an economic structure be condemned if not because its dynamic is motivated by the need to valorize capital rather than by the workers' needs of development? On what other basis could Marx have opposed to the realm of material production as the realm of necessity? Another realm, that of free self-activity, of freedom, why otherwise would we have had such a high regard as a positive model of the future for free time devoted to many-sided activity and for the raising of labor to meet the needs of life, always using leisure as the yardstick of the real wealth of society? How otherwise could he have asserted the positive character of the individual pro property that comes with the disappearance of private property and the distribution of goods according to individual needs? Bernstein's penetrating scrutiny discerned the value judgment in Marx's attitude and sought to remove it from the economic analysis of capitalist society, when in, when in fact the two aspects are inseparable. Without premises of value, Marx's work would be a merely implicit critique of capitalism, lacking an inherent investigation into the nature of capitalism he would be an anti-capitalist romantic.